solving today's most exciting challenges in the ecosystem is beyond scope of a single organization. We are looking forward to collaborating with various industry players to shape and create value in financial services ecosystem for the future by building the capabilities today. The challenge we have is to translate ability to deliver low value services at high volume. Welcome to the Future of Financial Services Thought Leadership Series by Zolke. Today we are here with Rajiv from HSBC and um, Rajiv, could you a little bit introduce yourself? Thank you, Ruchi. First off, thank you to Zulke team for having me over for these series uh, of conversations on the future of financial services ecosystems. Uh, my name is Rajiv Tumala. I work at HSBC Security Services. I am part of their data, digital and innovation team. I lead the digital product uh, for HSBC Security Services for Asia and Middle East. Part of my job is to sort of project the future back onto the present and look at the implications for our business and how can we help position our clients to leverage these emerging technologies to serve their clients better. So Rajiv, since we are here today to talk about uh, financial services ecosystem, maybe let's just start by defining what really is a banking ecosystem. I mean, everything is an ecosystem or we define uh, uh, parties coming together, entities coming together to work uh, on a common theme of an ecosystem, right? So let's primarily sort of explore where did the word ecosystem come from? I believe we borrowed the word ecosystem from biology. Yes. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, if you privately look at uh, the ecosystems as we learned uh, in, in uh, biology, it is primarily different organisms coming together that have a symbiotic and synergetic relationship between them. There are producers in the ecosystem, uh, there are consumers in the ecosystem, um, and there are organisms that help sort of connect producers and uh, consumers. There are also decomposers in the ecosystem, right? So that sort of keep the ecosystem clean. Right. And if you sort of map that on to, like you asked, how does the financial services ecosystem look like? It is absolutely no different, I think, right? So you have both producers, consumers in a financial services ecosystem. We have banks, I know that act is largely both a producer, so we banks sort of produce assets that potentially some of our clients would need. We are also consumers of the client's requirements um, and, and we have different types of clients, right? Both banks work with each other. Banks also collectively work for their clients. We also work for different types of clients. We work for man on the street. We also work for uh, small to medium scale businesses. We work for large corporations and these are different types of clients. Uh, there are regulators to ensure fair use of infrastructure uh, that banks and also some, some of our clients have to follow. Uh, we'll have to ensure safety and security of the assets that we have uh, in our balance sheets. So it is a very symbiotic and synergetic relationship like a uh, biological ecosystem. What is unique about banking services is technology is increasingly playing a very critical role in delivering the banking services to the ecosystem, right? So infrastructure, and that part of infrastructure is what has been changing of late. Uh, so earlier, banks delivered majority of their services by consistently executing processes with the help of people. Yeah. And increasingly we see that banks uh, and the ecosystem in, at large consumes and delivers these services on the backbone of a technology infrastructure. That's how I see what the financial services ecosystem was and where we are headed to. Correct. Absolutely. And in fact, each of these partners or each of these members of the ecosystem have, has a huge role to play. Uh, the banks are producers as well as consumers of the services. You have consumers which are B2C consumers, B2B consumers at the same time. Uh, you also have technology providers, fintechs coming in together and producing new set of services with the help of this ecosystem. So, um, and each of them has an important role to play. Uh, but 
if we look back and um, you know this this ecosystem has been evolving we have come from an age of legacy banks uh, brick and mortar banks where the services were rendered very manually to a age where they are digitally driven as you as you said um, and uh, more and more digital is becoming the core of the business as we go forward right so how have you seen this ecosystem evolving in asia um, specifically focusing in southeast asia which has been a growing economy and uh, you know changing economy at a very very rapid pace in past decade or so if you primarily look at you know asia and southeast asia as a block right so there are about 670 or 680 million people except probably for singapore and a few other countries there is large tracts of population that are underbanked right not unbanked but underbanked the challenge as this block of economy sort of develops is it needs very efficient last mile service capability mm-hmm. and if you ask me as you correctly pointed out the last mile is being dominated by digital channels right so traditionally uh, minded organizations no banks have to sort of embed themselves into these last mile journeys and that is both an opportunity and also a significant challenge i believe so especially if you focus on southeast asia and asia at large the challenge we have for banks and the financial services ecosystem is to translate what i would call ability to deliver low value services at high volume right and traditionally developed markets have incentivized banks to primarily deliver high value services at low volume but asia and especially southeast asia demands the delivery of low value services at high volume because these economies are moving from emerging to developed and that's the basic ask uh from our clients and you know their clients to sort of bring the technology infrastructure bring the infrastructure that is fit for their digital economies in a way we can deliver a lot of low value services but at high volume or high scale so scalability is is primarily the ask and as technologists and and digitally minded people we know that scale only comes with technology absolutely and um, that's a great perspective by the way you know uh, low value and high volume to drive financial inclusion to be able to do the social good as well at um, while yeah. doing business that is part of the agenda right so as you go down the value chain or as you extend your services to be more inclusive uh low value services uh is a way like you correctly point out uh to deliver inclusive services that is how i think we can basically take these economies that are largely underbanked to appropriately banked right is that infrastructure is required because you can't scale using not without using technology absolutely and uh, definitely it requires a lot of preparation right especially for uh, the banks who have been operating in a very legacy uh, environment but at the same time serving multi country business so what sort of preparation or what sort of work the banks are doing to be able to participate in this evolving ecosystem not all banks are cut from the same cloth so there are regional banks there are global banks and there are also very specific domestic banks that specifically focus on uh, certain segments of the economy all these institutions need different kind of solutions yes right and that's primarily where i believe partnerships come into play right so at large financial institutions right so i think there is an increasing acceptance that banks only mm. you know everyone is a profit uh, oriented machine with purpose right so with purpose inclusion uh, all those values continue to sort of drive us so what we need is the right kind of partnerships so we just don't make money by deploying infrastructure and deploying technology infrastructure we make money by putting assets and making that infrastructure work for the ecosystem that we service in that's primarily where you see evolving trends 
uh, in the ecosystem, right? So there is emergence of what I would call as DPUs, digital public utilities. So how can we deliver services uh, largely on digital public utilities? Now, digital public utilities are going to be very country specific. So if you are a large global bank, then you've got to start and begin thinking about how do your global systems integrate with these last mile digital public utilities, which act as channels, right? Right. So there has to be flexibility in terms of integrating. And if you are a regional bank, you've got to similarly think about it. The segment that you want to serve, what is the digital public utility? Have the digital public utility completely evolved? No, right? So they are also evolving. So you've got to basically integrate lock, step and barrel, right? So you have to evolve. So that means the need of the hour is flexibility in terms of system design and architecture. Right. Even if you're a global bank, how do you sort of cater to local variables? Right. So how do you harmonize them again, right? So repeatedly, whether it is scale or whether you want to basically cater to local variances and still continue to deliver delightful customer experience, the answer continues to be flexible technology infrastructure. Uh, right. So for the digital economies of Asia and Southeast Asia, uh, I think they need a flexible digital infrastructure into which financial services have to embed themselves, right? So the ecosystems uh, that we are talking about, the ask is primarily, you know, make or deliver services that are seamless. Right. So how do you deliver and make these services seamless? You should basically be creating embeddable services. Yeah. Uh, it can be financial, you know, financial services come in many different shades. Right, so insurance is a financial service, wealth advisory is a financial service, even providing you access to assets on a stock exchange is a financial service. Yes. Uh, you know, custodying and safekeeping of your clients, assets is a financial service. Now we need to basically look at it and as we develop this digital technology infrastructure, we got to basically ask ourselves, uh, how do we adopt hmm. these things? I don't think there are three steps, right? So first we have to look at, like you correctly pointed out, where are we and what is the new capability that is available and how do we transition? So as you transition, I think you will develop some ideas about how the service can transform. And that leads to, I think, reimagination and embedding that particular service into uh, appropriate digital public utility or a new type of digital channel and you know the world that we are in you know is given how easy is it to sort of produce services from fintechs or produce infrastructure uh, that is required to deliver these services there are two trends in parallel right so there are platform shift happening and there are paradigm shifts happening as well so you got to primarily uh, look at First comes platform shift and on the backbone of that particular platform comes a paradigm shift. So how do we want to understand and then prepare, position ourselves uh, to take advantage, leverage the platform shifts that are happening to again, right? So end of day, it always comes back to how do we help our clients help their consumers seamlessly, right? right. How do we embed or how do we enable embedding? these services. And that's going to be the theme, I think, for ecosystems for the next 15, 20 years right. uh, as digital economy takes off, right? So I think I don't think anyone's arguing about, you know, where the leapfrog is going to happen. The leapfrog is going to happen in the digital economy, right? New economy is going to take a significant share of growth and we need to find a way to service our existing clients and, you know, potentially new clients who are going to get wings, I should say, from the digital economy. Right. That's a um, very unique thing which you just said uh, about the platform shift and the paradigm shift. Maybe we talk a little bit uh, further on that and I try to understand your perspective on uh, and also like what are you doing towards um, both of these shifts, you know, and how are you transitioning there? Yeah, right. So platform shifts and paradigm shifts are quite unique for probably the last three decades, mm -hmm. right? So there have been platform shifts and paradigm shifts all the time. But the last two or three decades have been specific to have implications to financial services, right? So let's rewind back about 
you know, couple of decades and look at in the whole shift to cloud. So shift to cloud uh, is a platform shift, uh, right? So it sort of gave you on-demand computing um, and so on. Yes. Uh, but, you know, did it significantly change the way you did business? I should probably say for financial services, you know, while, you know, you had to keep your data safe and secure, it did not significantly change, but it did position ourselves to deliver superior client experience. That platform shift to cloud then enabled several other possibilities, right? So then came mobile, and then that basically brought a new way of delivering services and and platform shift will and the ability to have certain amount of computing power in your pocket then led to a paradigm shift called branchless banking, right? So right. digital banking, ability to pay wherever you want and without using plastic. It's almost like scaffolding in life. There, there are platform shifts coming and then that's why I keep saying, if you don't transition uh, to platforms and then think about transformation, you will miss paradigm shift opportunities. So these days, everything builds on top of another, right? So they say you stand on the shoulders of giants. Yeah. So each platform shift is like that, right? So as you shift and you got to basically move and every move positions yourself to sort of be ready for the paradigm shift. So we talked about the cloud that enabled mobile and then that basically bought a new way of delivering. And, and it is when the paradigm shifts happen, breakthroughs also come through, right? If you, again, going back to our conversation on South and South, Southeast Asia, it is the paradigm shift that basically gave an opportunity to a number of entrepreneurs then to break through yep. and deliver services in that last mile uh, using completely digital experiences or digital channels. So without cloud, there is no mobile. Without mobile, there is no last mile digital channel. And without that, there is no Uber, Deliveroo, you know, a bunch of these brands which came out of the woods in the early 2010s. And now they're, they're, there's a lot of, you know, multi-billion dollar companies on the back of that. And then what are the new economy companies asking for financial services, right? They're asking to embed payments. They're asking to embed insurance. They're asking to embed wealth services into those delivery channels. And suddenly you have a new crop of SMEs uh, and also SMEs that demand services in a different way. They don't want to walk into a branch. They want to be able to select, filter, and accept a service. That means the bank's own infrastructure has to be ready to be able to embed into, into these kind of channels. Yes. So that's the evolving opportunity, I think. And that's primarily where you know, technology becomes front center of developing core services and then extending them off to uh, serve new demand from our clients. So Rajiv, we talked about um, ecosystem. We talked about the paradigm shifts which are happening in, in the ecosystem. So I'd like to go a little deeper in um, our preparation towards making these paradigm shifts, right? So what are some of the key things um, some large banks like yours are doing to um, make these paradigm shifts? I think, let me speak a bit more uh, in generic terms, right? So I think each platform shift as it is coming through is, is giving us an opportunity and also I think teaching us the necessity for being more modular, right? And sort of centralize some of the common services that large parts of the banks uh, or various parts of the bank uh, want to consume internally uh, as well. Uh, so each platform shift sort of is making us more modular, a little bit more nimbler relatively, uh, and is preparing us for the coming paradigm shift. Right? So I do strongly believe that platform shifts precede paradigm shifts. And not every platform shift is going to result in a paradigm shift. So maybe there are a couple of platform shifts that happen before a big paradigm shift comes through. Now, coming back to your question, I just briefly spoke about how cloud computing and mobiles, smartphones, uh, sort of gave us a paradigm shift. 
now if you primarily look at the hot topics of the 2020s right so it's been blockchain dominated uh, for certain time now it is uh, the time for ai uh, generative ai in specific right i do think both of these put together in in their own ways um, are both a platform and a paradigm shift but then again coming back to our topic around ecosystem right so a paradigm shift happening in the ecosystem when adoption of a certain platform is to a large extent uh, almost like a minimum viable product there is a minimum viable adoption that is required for uh, platforms yeah. to enable the paradigm shift so you can't just certain set of participants in the ecosystem can't run too far ahead of the other parts of the ecosystem and expect a paradigm shift if you really ask me uh, blockchain or distributed ledger technology and all the assets that were created on that particular infrastructure as digital assets is an example of i think lopsided innovation i should say so some parts new uh, participants the participants in the ecosystem a are not uh, static right so they're dynamic and new entrants sometimes tend to innovate way faster than incumbents which is natural but if that innovation becomes a bit lopsided and certain parts of the ecosystem they run far ahead then you will have imbalance right so imbalance and then that sort of pulls to put these participants together right so there is there would be some kind of a backlash uh or an governance issue and then sort of you then understand why certain participants were a little bit skeptical yeah then there is a bit of a reset one of the interesting aspects is when a platform shift enters the boring phase of the Gartner hype cycle is when the seeds for a paradigm shift are sown. That basically tells you that the platforms become a commodity or platform easy to adopt and then that sort of begins uh, the paradigm shift. That is primarily where new business model and starts uh, evolves because now platforms broadly available and that's not yet happened with both blockchain or with generative ai there are two interesting uh, capabilities i should say and especially in generative ai i think we are in the very early days so we have large language models but we don't yet have domain specific or product specific large language models yet i do think once they basically get in there is a significant potential for paradigm shifts in how we deliver client experience yeah is there an ability to sort of design products at much more personalized level right so i think in the past we thought we can do mass personalization or i think generative ai potentially can give the ability to every organization to create a product for one consumer because one of the marvelous things about technology is the marginal cost of delivering anything using technology um become closer to zero right so yeah. so you can deliver to the variants using technology where the marginal cost is low you can create a product for one yeah. right so that's what i think excites um uh, me about generative ai that you can do a lot more personalized experiences or client or personalized products for client or if you can create a product of one or product for one yeah uh with a sustainable marginal cost and last primarily the gift i believe of generative where we have certain amount of distance to travel and imagine if financial services of ecosystem can create product for one you are becoming more inclusive the ecosystem scope is massively increasing there's a lot more responsibility on the technology service providers to basically get that done with proper governance you know adhering to regulations and being able to explain and we are seeing that shift of explainability in ai coming uh, the other exciting but not so new technology is distributed ledger technology i do think it uh, it has huge implications for how you record your assets and how you make them available for verification uh, and and if you really look at any large financial institution right at the core of that financial institution is assets and liabilities and the way you record them right and you go and ask any large financial institution today you ask them how many ledgers do you have 
the number would come in come out in thousands right so thousands of ledgers are kept and they are not compatible with each other and then you basically have to create new and very specific way of integrations and you would know that uh, you would work on projects purely to get two systems to talk to each other because they are you know incompatible technologies and as more and more distributed ledger technologies capabilities and mostly right the capability influences thinking as more of that thinking and mindset takes root in the organization uh, i do think there is a possibility of maybe a medium size or a large financial institution running a completely on a programmable ledger mm-hmm. creating programmable assets and making those assets widely available as well right so the advantage of programmable assets i believe is inclusivity you can suddenly come back to my original point around low ticket and high volume and that's a gift right so accessibility to financial services increases and if you are you know if you ask me implications for wealth management then become uh, huge yeah. right so for the same 100 dollars you are going to have much more diversified portfolio because you can have low tickets yeah. uh then and that's a gift that's inclusive uh financial advice right so we respect you of how much money you have most of our clients can have the same diversified portfolio and that also means that investments are going into you know different kinds of projects and those investments can be turned into assets to be owned by end consumers then that means that capability to finance uh some very interesting because you're diversifying the risk away across many many different parties yeah. uh potentially there will be a lot more capital available for doing many interesting things in an economy and these are the implications of uh, you know i'm just just melding technology implications for capital and also investment but that's how it's going to evolve great and this it's not new right we've seen this when the stock exchanges were manual run by agents and now moving to completely digital stock exchanges it clearly again brings back the point that um for an ecosystem to thrive all the participants and the readiness of the infrastructure is very very important all participants need to adopt the platform and thereby drive a mass adoption of the platform you rightly talked about blockchain and digital assets which is an evolving ecosystem and uh, all the banks all the financial institutions as well as fintechs are now looking at participating in that ecosystem uh, i think generative ai um, you know is working towards building another set of capabilities uh, on this ecosystem too but what role do you think data plays in the ecosystem increasingly right so data is the lifeblood of the ecosystem right so data represents many different things right so end of day like you can take a human being all of us and basically distill it down to the common dna right so i think data is the dna of ecosystem and it is how efficiently the ecosystem partners are able to exchange uh, and make use of consume and produce data and defines ability to thrive of that particular ecosystem and ability to scale okay. and and increasingly i think what we are seeing is you look at the traditional patterns in technology or to sort of couple processing and data together right now uh, you know microservices sort of make it possible to completely uncouple uh, processing uh, and data yeah. right uh, state is completely uncoupled uh, and a new banks are uh, and even uh, large financial institutions are coming up with unified data infrastructure you know in basically the face i the cloud or cloud on prem still a private cloud uh to sort of have very many uh, data sets you know newer architectures like data mesh are evolving yeah. right so making it easier to embed governance into the design of the data infrastructure and what it makes is it makes it easier for our consumers to both consume and produce data sets they come back in but as i said ecosystems thrive because of the ability to share yeah uh, uh data as in a seamless way and that's what is the reason when we say we are able to embed a service into a channel all all what it is doing is the seamless exchange of data somebody needs 
certain verification last game, right? Sending some data to verify, and you're able to look up and then do that seamlessly using APIs and other constructs. And there are needs to share humongous data sets on the fly. And then there is technology that allows you to do it today, right? So data sharing um, is there. And, and that's why I, I do like, you, you brought up a very good point, but data is the lifeblood of every ecosystem and ecosystems infrastructure uh, and common utilities that allow the participants to share their data seamlessly with guardrails, right? Again, you know, having the right access to data for the right reasons and how seamless can you make that is an example uh, or that's what drives the successful uh, ecosystem, I think, or ecosystem that scale. And that's primarily where I also think the role of uh, government and public utilities come through. And that is the reason why, you know, common payment infrastructure, you know, ability to do KYC AML using digital public utilities, they do play a very significant role. Yeah. So it's not just private ecosystems or privately formed ecosystems. I do believe digital public utilities that offer common utilities meet for KYC AML of firms or uh, retail. <laughs> Uh, play a significant role in sort of smoothening up the interactions between uh, various uh, participants. participants. And we did also see, like bringing back to your point of paradigm shift, right? Yeah. We did the paradigm shift happening with open banking, yeah. say for instance. And I think Singapore took a lead in there. Uh, we saw, you know, this evolving, especially in Asia, the first and the rest of the world actually followed. So how has your experience been with that? Open banking, again, right, so it's coming back to the ecosystem and my point about is the ecosystem and the governance surrounding the ecosystem allowing for seamless access to data across different participants with guardrail, that is the client consent, if you're able to do that. And open banking is an example of that framework of easier data sharing or data sharing with clear guidelines. And that will basically then allow a financial services ecosystem to thrive. You would allow new participants and incumbents to freely share data with appropriate consents in place. So then you can probably use that particular data for creating product of one, right? So now, how do you know what your client preference are if you don't have data around their preferences? How can you create a product of one? And so that's primarily where we are in it too. I think there is a journey to be made. I, I believe in open banking. Uh, not one ecosystem has had it right, so we are still learning. Uh, yes, there is data that is being made available, but there is a journey to be made, and then we still need to think around, okay, how 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 is someone monetizing that particular data? Is it a fair use of data? I think fair use of data is going to be a very recurring theme. And how about embedded finance? This has been um, a wave, um, I suppose, which has been, you know, going on, uh, but we have yet uh, to see the culmination of uh, the embedded finance that finance everywhere and, you know, at um, your fingertips at all the time. Yes, there is progress there, but still looks like it is, it's a journey. But, you know, what is the goal of embedded finance is to deliver a service that a client needs in the context of what he's doing yeah. or what they are doing, right? So that's the primary goal. And we are, again, there's been a lot of conversations and talk around embedded finance, but I think it is taking off now, right? So for example, you go to buy an airline ticket today, you are able to buy travel insurance then and there, right? So, so one of the things that embedded finance is, is going to help us with is also delivering value closer to the moment of demand, right? So how do you sort of reduce the time lag between the customer thinking of a particular product or a value he needs now, and then the infrastructure being available for us to deliver, right? How can you deliver value closer, as close as possible to the moment of demand? You need a lot of infrastructure for that, and I don't think now infrastructure is there, so you can basically buy insurance at the time that infrastructure is laid out. Yeah. Uh, but it's not uniformly available in all parts of the ecosystem yet. So seamless sharing of data. Are you getting enough data for underwriting the ask there, right? So who is the customer? What is he doing? 
does it travel frequently? You, you need all this kind of data. And now, that's a data sharing question, right? So yes. if the basic data sharing capabilities are there in the infrastructure, then it becomes standard underwriting question, right? Are you willing to underwrite it? What premium would you want to underwrite to that particular provider? And those things are coming through. You have to deliver your services in an invisible way, but the services are important. So instead of buying them discreetly, yeah. I think you're going to buy some of these products in a continuous manner. You'll buy an airline ticket and an insurance and an idea to invest something where you're traveling to, right? So that, that's not yet there, right. but you probably say, hey, like six businesses there, they are listed on a stock exchange and maybe a distributed exchange. Uh, and these are the prices of, or you can say, yeah, hey, you're flying on this airline. And then, uh, and if you have had a fantastic experience, maybe there is a suggestion to see, yeah. would you like this airline to be part of your portfolio? Right? Yeah, yeah, indeed. And I mean, you rightly uh, brought out all the building blocks which are needed, which is the infrastructure, the readiness of the infrastructure to be able to provide those services. But at the same time, modular services being built on that infrastructure. Right. And then the last, um, you know, endpoint connectivity, to provide this integration between these modules, right? So that should be, I mean, the good thing is, I think new age infrastructure uh, has native design that thinks about integration. And in fact, data sharing is one of the key components, again, which is, uh, you know, uh, needed uh, and is also facilitated by the infrastructure which we are currently building together to build this ecosystem and evolve this ecosystem further. And I think everyone's also realizing that not all infrastructure needs to be developed by private corporations, right? So I think digital public utilities and do form a, a key component of private ecosystems. Yes. Right? So that's, that's the other, I think, takeaway from the last five to seven years is look at digital public utilities that operate at scale, you know, be in Singapore, India is another great example of, Indeed. you know, a fantastic public technology stack, I would say, right? So. And that is allowing for that particular economy to thrive by allowing access to services to new incumbents that are able to potentially create a product for one, right? So we can keep talking about product for one probably for the next 50 years because that's how much potential there is. But you need a lot of infrastructure play. All of that digital shovels and picks are going to come from technology firms or technology first firm. Uh, and they are going to form a critical backbone of every thriving and surviving ecosystem. Yes, indeed. And we've seen that in, in the human history as well, where, you know, civilizations developed around uh, rivers. Uh, that became the first infrastructure, then the road infrastructure, then the rail infrastructure, uh, and then the economies developing around those. And now we're talking about digital infrastructure, which is now uh, becoming like uh, a de facto, uh, which is facilitated by the public utility. Uh, and uh, service providers like the banks and technology providers are responsible then to build uh, ecosystems around that. And that's what... And if you also look at how did the financial services ecosystem sort of develop, why did the financial services players become global, right? So you look at like financial services as a part of economy is largely developed in the last two, three hundred years. And it's primarily was the globalness uh, was driven by this training, right? So goods, training of goods, right? So my own firm, HSBC, is as, as many countries as possible because they're simply going where their clients work. Yes. Right? And then, you know, branches came up. And today, for you to be where your clients are, you don't need a physical branch. You need to embed yourself into that client's need. In the past, Maybe if you go back to 150 years ago, if you had to deliver a service at the moment of demand, you need to have a branch in the port. So HSBC was there in Hong Kong, Singapore, London, Dubai, all port cities, right? So to deliver the service at the moment of demand, you needed to be in a geography. To deliver the service at the moment of demand, you need to embed yourself into a digital channel. So the thriving ecosystems are going to be backed by world-class digital infrastructure and the world-class digital infrastructure can be anywhere. It can be in an emerging country, it can be in a developed country. In fact, I do think emerging economies 
have an opportunity to leapfrog. So younger population, countries with younger population who are digitally inclined because they don't know any other way, probably create opportunities for thriving digital ecosystems of which financial services would be a part of. So potentially, uh, a closing remark would be around there's not going to be financial services ecosystems, but there is going to be much broader ecosystems in which financial services will be a small part. Part of it, yes. And which is supported by the digital infrastructure yeah. and the digital capabilities being at the core of it. Correct. So thank you, Rajiv, uh, for sharing these perspectives. It was lovely, um, you know, discussing the future of uh, financial services ecosystem. I think I could already see the how the future is going to be evolving and what role um, each of these uh, participants of the ecosystem and especially organizations like Soke will be playing in this ecosystem to help uh, evolve it. We spoke about the platform shifts and paradigm shifts. I think that's going to be a key takeaway for me to think about um, after our discussion. Uh, but lovely chatting with you. Yeah. Thank you uh, for an excellent conversation. Um, and of course, right, so the world and the future is exciting. I do believe uh, firms like Zulke have a critical role uh, in building out the digital infrastructure of various forms, right? And as we discussed, the ecosystems will have financial services. I can't envision a future where there will be only a financial services ecosystem. I think we'll want to embed ourselves and the services into where our clients are. Absolutely. Thank you, Thank you so much. <laughs>